villains, gangsters, or faces as they prefer to be called, are the men that have been making newspaper headlines for all the wrong reasons over the past 50 years. Some are instantly recognisable, but many are not. And if I stick a gun in your face, you're going to open up the door. I've got no worry, but even if the glass is bulletproof, and you know it's bulletproof, you're still going to open up that, because you're not going to trust your life against a bit of glass. Men like Eddie Richardson, Paul Ferris, Frankie Fraser and Walter Norville, who have inspired fear and respect in equal measure for decades. People did fear me, yeah, because I was dangerous. In this new series, some of Britain's most infamous and influential characters have agreed to go on camera and tell it how it was and is. All of a sudden I went, <laughs> I went you move, I'll blow your fucking head off. Obviously, like, I didn't know, they put big gun in me head like that. I went, ah. So I took a dive when the shot went off, obviously, to get me in new water. And after I got the main new water, I waited two seconds and I took a dive on the front door and I slammed the front door behind us and got behind the brick walk. And that's when the uh, bullets saw kind of coming through the front door. I've had uh, aggravated burglary, torture, um, people being kidnapped and broken legs, broken arms, um, blackmail, racketeering, extortion. I've been done for everything you can think of. I'm not a electrician or a plumber or a dentist or anything like that. I'm a crook and uh, I get back into serious crime and get paid dividends for the next five years. My name is Bernard O'Mahony. I was a friend of the Cray Twins and a member of the infamous Essex Boys firm. I know this world, I know the faces, and I'm going to give you a no-holds-barred history of the British criminal underworld. For more than 50 years, two ruthless gangs have dominated the Tyneside underworld. Initially, the Conroy and the Sayers families lived side by side in relative harmony in the west end of Newcastle. But the birth of the drug fueled rave culture in the late 1980s changed everything. Both with the intense desire to take complete control of the North East, the families went to war with one another and with anyone else who stood in their way. What followed was a street war of mindless violence. We've come to Newcastle to speak to Paddy Conroy. Uh, the Conroys are probably um, the city's most uh, infamous family um, during the 80s and 90s. They were pretty much untouchable in this city. And um, they were allegedly involved in kidnap, torture, and uh, they've also been accused of several, several uh, high-profile murders. But um, in fairness, they've not been convicted of any. And Paddy uh, feels very strongly about allegations made against him by people in uh, trials. And basically, he wants to have his say and, uh, you know, clear his name. Called me dad, Mr. Newcastle. That's what the folk used to call him back in the 60s and 70s. He robbed all the post offices, uh, robbed all the stately homes. Um, he was a fighter as well. He was a hard, hard man as well, apart from being a villain. Um, but apart from that, he was, he was a decent fella, you know? Yeah. So, what, what, what was the police view of him? What, what, how, did they, what did they think of him? What they, how did they treat him? And... Police were through water every week for one reason or the other. Uh, and my dad was always fighting with them. Every, every week he was fighting with them. One cop I was getting knocked out in one place over all his life. That's all the relationship he had with the police, like. And, and the police, did they sort of tarnish you all with the same brush and give yeah. the old family grief? Yeah, yeah. Because of your father? We, we grew up as kids with our father having to put up with them coming through the fucking door. And f twice I, I, I woke up one night and they were climbing over my bed. They'd put a ladder out of the... Uh, back window and climbed through my bedroom window. They were looking for Ronnie Biggs, he'd, he'd escaped. Um, and that's what they were doing that night. They didn't they weren't even knock and they were just coming in when he was asleep, when he was drunk and hoping to get him before he woke up, before, you know what I mean? To stop the fighting. But every time they raided the house, coppers were getting took away in ambulances and 
people getting carried away. Paddy was getting a reputation as a young man who could handle himself and was offered a job working on the doors in Newcastle. I think the first time I was on a door when I was about 16 or 17, when I just was with my dad and we called in that 69 club and Big Billy and Paddy were running it and my dad knew Paddy. And uh, when he went for a drink with him, up in the, up in the club, Billy and Paddy, they just stuck me on the door, you know what I mean, that neat. That was my first night on a door when I was just about 17. Billy was a big ex-professional boxer of his day who nobody could touch in a fight or them that during his period. You know, I just he could fight my fun. He wasn't a villain. He wasn't a bad man, he was just sort of a hard man. Um and he's he's, he's got a lot of respect Billy in an office. Paddy uh, wheelers, gets it, you know. Nice lad, little bit of a jumpy jack and got a bit Chicky now and again, you know, but uh, all right, you know. Well known, very well known, respected, you know. Um, hard man. Another well known face from Newcastle's club scene was Kenny Pander Anderson, who was one of the North East's criminal elite. He was a founding member of the Geordie Mafia and has a history of conviction stretching back more than 50 years. In 1969, the craze came to Newcastle to discuss the purchase of some gaming machines. When they were asked to leave the nightclub they were in, Panda was given £2,000 to give to the craze by the frightened club owner once he realised his mistake. Panda didn't rate them at all and put it straight into his pocket. It wouldn't, it wouldn't last a weekend, not a weekend. They could only fight. I'm not in my punk, so I did. I met them twice and we was half looking. One he was looking like a Rod's look. And I was going, what's the matter? What are you looking at? You, do you know what you're looking at? I was going to be 19 on my toes for a moment. They never bothered me at all. Freddie Foreman, different man, but he's got a different style. They were like, they weren't even gangsters, man. That, that good people like Joy Pyle and people like that weren't actually on the film. All Freddie never on the film, but they helped them out when they were in trouble. They couldn't, they couldn't do nothing else. When they come to Newcastle, they were double lucky, they were double, but they were sat quiet as could be. The Crays had plenty to fear in Newcastle, as well as the Conroys, there were two other major crime families in the city, the Sayers and the Harrisons. Both had a mafia-type reputation for blackmail, robbery and drug dealing, and both had large families who meted out violence. They all lived and fought each other on the streets of the West End, Paddy Conroy first met John Henry Sayers on the door of a nightclub called Wheelers. No, when I was working at Wheelers, my brother Lenny asked us to try and get fucking John Sayers a job on the fucking door. I don't really know John Sayers. And I couldn't be fucked on him with my door on me, but my brother Lenny fucking passed us. So I asked if we could stick him on the door, but so they said they would try him, Billy and Paddy. Um, and if, I think it was the first night. I was fighting with the gates at lads, there was, was a few of them. And ended up on my back and they were on top of us. They were coming in and walking ourselves all the time. And uh, when I was doing on my back with them on top of us, he has to be, they were doorman come up and he says, How are lads? One on the one. You know, and I'm on my back fighting with them, getting me fucking head punched in. And that's all that, that was his help. How are lads? One on the one. And that was his finish after that, like. He was gone a week later. Not for anything other than he was, he was shit as a fucking doorman. Slowly, the violence escalated. One night, the Conroy's other rivals, the Harrisons, petrol-bombed the local house while a young girl and a child were inside. For Paddy, this was a step too far. But the fire engines have come through it and shot up the street next to the pub. Two of them with the lights flashing and sirens gone. Well, that's where we lived in them three streets. So I says to him, get out that's to see where them fire engines has gone, just to make sure, cos it's one of wolves. So he had to walk with the pub. Along the street, and he come back and he says, uh, "Who's is on fire? Kids' bedroom and the uh, horrors have just put a petal bomb through it. Little girls burn on. But apart from that, they'd put the fire out and everybody was all right. But the horrors had done it. And then more area, there'd always been rules, unwritten rules, like, like you didn't do them sort of strokes, petal bomb people's houses, from old. Um, 
So I went berserk. You know, they shouldn't be doing it. So I thought, I thought right, I'll catch them, or the next, next time I see them, I'm going to fucking pull them. The Harrisons and the Conroys eventually agreed to meet and have a straightener, a one-on-one -on -one fight between family members to settle the bad blood. They, they wanted to arrange a fight, a proper fight, the way you do. So I said, they come to see me then. So I said, no bother. The father did. The brother wanted to fight one of my nephews and my brother. So we arranged a fight uh, between one of my nephews and one of their lot, and my brother was one of their lot, just to keep it right. But uh, And it was supposed to be just me and the dad there when the fight was happening. But what had happened was, uh, my brother kind of fucking fight, and they brought the best fighter to fight him, you know what I mean? He's never had a fight in his fucking my life all that. He's not, he's not known for being a fighter. He's not like the rest of us. So he got chinned. He got put on his back, to be honest. He was fighting a big young fella, you know what I mean? He's, he's a lot older than him. But she kind of did out about it, like, but uh, when he was doing, he started of kicking him, this fella. And I heard, well, then he said, I've had enough. So I thought, right, I'll stop now. And he didn't. He booted him again. And then he said, I've had enough. And I heard him say he'd had enough a few times. I couldn't help myself. But it's got in. <laughs> um, so I've done him. But there was a load of them head behind the bushes anyway. It wasn't just the dad there. They had another five head behind the bushes. And they come out and I got hit with bricks and got stuck into them, like. I made them run away. But they wounded us with bricks and that before they got away. Run off. That's what happened with the horrors. And then after, well, you know, it led on to fucking all that shit. Well, the Conroys are known all over, aren't they? they? You know, they've got a, a name, like so the, the Harrisons, the, the Sears, they've all got wet. Ooh, you know, people get a bit worried, you know what I mean? But I thought, like I say, I think people who can handle ourselves respect other people that can't handle ourselves. I mean, it's not that would put any of the other ones down. It's just to be like it. If I was a hard man and I went to meet another hard man, we would get on straight away. That's just the way it is, you know. The proper man is somebody saying, yeah, come on, I'll fight you. You know what I mean? And stand two at the two. And when you've, when it's finished, shake hands. You know, that's what I've always done. I've always picked people up. You know, and made sure they're all right. Didn't hold a grudge or nothing. You know, and I kind of, I don't think there's many people held a grudge against me because it's always been their fault, mainly. This is the, uh, just off Westmoreland Road, in the west end of Newcastle, which uh, the Conroy family, uh, Lenny Conroy, Paddy's father, and Paddy and his brothers controlled for, um, since the 1960s, really. And uh, their name still commands respect in these areas. The violence between the Conroys and the Harrisons got worse, with both sides having to wear body armour and carry guns when they left their homes. One night, the Harrisons ambushed one of the Conroy firm, Michael the Bull Bullock. As I was running up the estate, I had dress shoes on, I could hardly run. I shouted to a young lad called Robert to get his front door open, get your door open, because we've got security doors there, they're all chasing us, had all sorts of weapons. And I remember getting going through his gate and that's when I got a samurai sword across the back of my neck. And as I've turned around, I got it stuck through my lungs and I grabbed onto the sword. And they were, luckily, they didn't come through the fence, they were over the fence, punching us in the face and that. And then Robert Lee's mum, Margie Allport, opened that door. When I heard the door open, I was fortunate to get there because I was pinned to the ground. I was fortunate to pull the sword out. I staggered in and collapsed and she slammed the door shut and they couldn't get in. And then they were off, I, I got a, they got us an ambulance. I tried to throw a lass out the ambulance because I thought I was dying, I couldn't breathe. But fortunately, I, I, I survived. And this is, because I was a bit overweight at the time, it was quarter of an inch from my heart, the, the blade of the sword. The 
Not only were the Conroys at war with other gangs, they were also taking on the police. On the 19th of July 1988, Paddy Conroy and three friends got into a scuffle in the centre of Newcastle. They sped off in their car and were chased home by the police. The resulting struggle in front of his Northbourne Road home turned violent and Paddy was beaten unconscious and arrested. The scene was witnessed by all of his neighbours. They'd hit me over the head with a truncheon before I got to the other, so I just thought, fuck this, I ended up chinning the two of them. Then I ended up my van, a load of them pulled up. And they just fucking kicked fuck out of us. Unconscious, kicked us unconscious, dragged us away. Um, and when I got to the police station the next morning, they said I'd injured one of them on the head with my phone, mobile phone, I hadn't, like. It was my next only about done that. And they said they planted a knife on us, saying there was a knife in my pocket when they lifted us off the ground. But I, I, I didn't have a knife on us. That night, over 70 people attacked Western Police Station with bricks, bottles and thunder flashes. Police cars were overturned and set alight, and the area became a no-go zone. When the police attacked Paddy, two of the police officers had him handcuffed, lying on the floor, and he, he was arrested. But then a policewoman walked over to him when all the police came, and she booted him. And when he moved with the pain, that's when they all attacked him. Now, the neighbours were there watching it. You're talking about the, the street were all watching and protect, like kicking off. And they got the dogs out to try and get people to get in the houses, but we all had little porches, so they, they refused to. In the scene, what had happened, the scene, the police attacking them. So that's why the, the, the neighbours were up and up, and that's why so many people wanted to go on the march, because they knew it was wrong. Conroy was eventually sentenced to six years sparking a rash of protests and even a justice for Paddy Conroy campaign. Michael Bullock, Paddy's closest friend, climbed the Tyne Bridge in the centre of Newcastle to protest. The city was in uproar. I climbed up on the bridge and another lad called Joe climbed up. He could only get up to the first rung because of all the uh, burglar grease. I got up to the top. Um, after an hour, the police, well, the police come on, he says, all right, Mr. Bullock, you've had your protest. Chief Superintendent Swift, I think, ah, fuck off, you know what I mean? So he asked Paddy's brother, Billy, to get us up down. Billy refused, so they arrested him for drunk disorderly. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. After the protests, tragedy soon struck both Bullock and the Conroys. The Bull and Paddy's brother, Neil, were doing some door and security work for a man called Harry Perry at the Green Tree pub. Rather than pay them wages, Perry gave them a gun. It was a fatal mistake. Neil wasn't even going to go out that night, but we went up there to see if we were getting paid, and he offered me a gun. So we went upstairs, got the gun. I thought we'd un unloaded it. Um, unfortunately, we hadn't. There was a bullet still left in. And Neil was carrying on, and he pointed it. I went, whoa, Nick, though. He went, yeah, man, and then I grabbed the gun. And when I grabbed the gun, unfortunately, it went off, and it resulted in Neil dying. Did you say where, where he was shot? He was... What happened after he was shot? When he was shot, he, was, he, was shot, he took a, a head wound. Uh, he was shot in the head. Um, the next thing, Harry Perry come running in, cos he'd been in a different room. We won an empty bar upstairs. So I was just screaming and shouting, get an ambulance, get an ambulance. I was cuddling Neil, I was trying to give Neil a, like, resuscitation and everything. And Perry just kept shouting, where's the gun? So I went, there's the fucking gun, I threw it at him. Um, I was shouting, get an ambulance. And the next thing I knew, it was as if I was in the twilight world, because all of a sudden the firemen come through the doors and they picked me off them and pulled me away. And then they, they were trying to resuscitate Neil and then the police and everyone was there. Um, and then they took Neil away and they took me to the police station, but I refused to speak to the police. I wanted to speak to Paddy. So they then brought Paddy to see us, and I was, my head was just gone. So when I gets in to the police station, they took us into like a cell with a table, one of them interview-type rooms, but it was this prison cell. And he was lying on the table pole, so I stretched it across the table, he was done in, he couldn't even lift his, lift his head up. The cop was sitting facing him, and I just looked at him and I just said, just tell us one thing. And when he looked up, I went, was it an accident? He went, I said, that'll do, keep your fucking mouth shut. So I was more worried in case he got nicked for the gun, though. Bull. 
because he's just a gun involved, you know what I mean? He's gone to jail for that, or he's gone to jail for it. It's just a fucking accident. I don't know exactly what's happened yet, but it's an accident. Neil's death just done my head in. It just, it just changed my life. It was just, I just couldn't comprehend it. We've been friends for a long time. We've done everything together. It just, well, it just devastated us. It's, it's, I've never recovered from it. Um, it's just something that pff, I wish I could turn back time. I wish, yeah, a lot of things different, but just totally just devastation. The West End became a war zone, and as the gang violence escalated, all the rules about not targeting private homes and family members went out of the window. One day, the Harrisons turned up at Paddy's house. But they've got guns, and then one of them's letting one of their shotguns go out the It must be out the window, out the other side of the passenger window. But it was at my front door. So I took a dive when the shot went off, obviously, to get behind my motor. And after I got behind my motor, I waited two seconds and I took a dive for the front door and I slammed the front door behind us and got behind the brick walk. And that's when the uh, bullets started kind of coming through the front door. So I waited till it stopped for a couple of, just a couple of shots. So I gave it about 10 seconds. Then I see my daughter along the end of the passage in the kitchen, so I had to take a fucking run along the passage just to get the... Well, that's was getting all the kids in from the back of the yard when all the shots were going off. So I had to run along the passage then to get my uh, daughter out the way of the final line and before I got to the end, I was shot in the back I was, I thought I was, and I ended up on the fucking floor, I'll tell you. I kept the bullet for a long time, she got rid of it when I was in prison. But what it had done was it had hit above the door, you know, the big concrete lintel, and it had ricocheted through the glass above the door, uh, and then hit us on the back, so it was like getting hit with a catapult, really, with a big lead bullet, you know what I mean? Every day there was shootings in the area, so every time you went out in your car, you, you, were, you were expecting to get shot at, you know, because it was, it was just, it was that rife at the time. Even though there was 22 shootings, I mentioned it in my court case, that was 22 that got reported. There was a lot more than 22 shootings over that time. But just no like that had happened in Newcastle before, I don't think, it, and they didn't know what to do with it themselves. They just, they just had to sit and monitor it and pick the pieces up when it was finished. That's where I viewed it. Word reached Paddy Conroy that the Harrisons had desecrated the graves of his father and brother. As far as he was concerned, somebody would now have to pay. My dad's grave got desecrated, smashed the gravestone up and whatnot. It was obvious it was them, but we couldn't prove it, obviously. But uh, then someone, Davy Glover, who was keep trying to get us involved with his battle with the Harris at that time, and we wouldn't get involved with him, we didn't want to deal with him. He kept coming to us saying, Billy Collier had done the grave, Billy Collier had done the grave. Because he's my wife's nephew, so I kind of sort of keep him away from us. I didn't even know what to do with him, though, at that time. So I listened to him, but I didn't take any notice of him, because he's got a personal battle gun with him. And then what he had told us, where Collier had been boasting about it, doing the gravestone in the Blue Man pub, somebody else who was in the pub that night come and tell us exactly the same, who I did trust. Um, and, and, and the air tellers are currently the same as Glover. They've they, they, they been planning to dig the body up next. According to rumours on the streets at the time, a friend of the Harrisons, Billy Collier, was offered £5,000 to dig up the body of Paddy's father, cut off his head and throw it through Paddy's front window. He was going to get paid to... Or they'd offer him the money to dig the grave up. So I went, right, that's all I want to know. Billy Collier was then taken to a friend's apartment by David Glover, tied up and tortured. As soon as I went in, I didn't think they'd harmed him. They tied his hands up. I thought, you fucking idiot, I shouldn't have done that to myself, you know? I'm making it more serious than what it is. Uh, all the police aren't even getting involved, as far as I'm concerned, this day. He's had a beating, he's admitted everything, and that's it. Why is the police going to get involved? And, uh, there was need, no dangers. But when I seen the ropes on his hand, I thought, oh, but anyway, he just went, Paddy, I'll tell you anything, I'll tell you anything, as I walked into the flat. And I didn't think he'd know I'd been tortured or anything, I just thought they tied his hands up or something while I'd been gone. Um, so I said, I know you will, I know you will, son. It was like, I was all right then. 
But I fucking I was a bit thingy with myself when I'm wrapping them up, you know what I mean? And that's when that's when one of them one of one of them that was safe lent I once said, I pulled three of his teeth out. I know he fucking shit myself. I didn't know what to do, to be honest. I thought, you've what? I've looked at him. He just spoke to me. He'd never, I couldn't see any of his teeth missing, but he's a smackhead and lots of them are black, you know what I mean? Um, and he's not speaking now, so I kind of look at his teeth. I was in a bit of a shock, really. <laughs> so I, I knew my brother in law, who lived in the next block. Um, he was safe, he wasn't a criminal. And out. I just says to one of them that was there, still there, can I fucking get my brother in law? For two seconds, and when my brother-in-law come along, I said to the, the one I said to us, he'd pull his teeth out, come outside you. I got him in my vehicle. He sat next to him, I went, what are you fucking done? I knew I was going mad then. And he looked at us, he went, I just put the pliers on his teeth and it crumbled. I went, no! <laughs> and then just as he says that, I turns around and there's the fucking police car pulling at the end of the car park. That turned up chasing me and whatnot. PC, trouble one, three, noble. Although Paddy hadn't taken part in the torture of Collier, both he and David Glover were eventually arrested, charged and remanded in custody to await trial. But en route to a court appearance, they arranged for an escape from the prison van. Um, so after we get on the bus and we leave the prison, we see the lads on the motorway, the picks up soon as we get out of the prison. War plan was we we're just going to pop the window and jump out the, jump out the window straight into the vehicles on the motorway in the other prison because there was roadworks there. There'll be a few daft screws, they're not going to fucking stop the other. Um, and that was war plan. There wasn't any guns or any great escape. And I wasn't going. That was the final decision on that day. I wasn't going, he was going on his own. Um, but like I say, we got cuffed to two screws. So that was the plan out the fucking window. We were supposed to escape as soon as we got outside the prison, within a half a mile. When the lads are sitting, who's set for, watching for the minibus, says we're cut tough, cuffed to two screws at an hour today. Then we're getting past the roadworks, where we were supposed to be jumping with the van window. And, you know, it's, it's another 20 odd mile in Newcastle. So they're just an hour today, so they just followed the, followed the uh, bus. And as we were going to Newcastle, I could see them driving past the thing and they're looking at us on the bus thinking what they would do. And I was trying not to fucking look at them because the screws, the screws sat there. And then David Glover who sat in the front, seat in front of us, turns around he, as these were passing, he's gone. You know what I mean? I thought, fucking shut up, you fucking loon, to myself. And he just turned the run Glover then, back in his seat, and then he just stood up. He went, stop that fucking bus, we've got help. And he just let, I won't pull the handbrake on because he was in the front. Seat, sort of, being the driver. And we're doing about 60 million now along the motorway when he pulled the handbrake on. And the bus just went into a... I don't know what never turned over, to be honest. We just went into a spin, like like that, without tipping over. And we just ended up, bump, landed in the fucking... Uh, where you pulling at the sides? The hot shelter. Uh, uh, not at the hot shelter, proper parking thing. Parking gate, like aye, but we were fighting the wrong way up the motorway. <laughs> That's where we ended up. <laughs> it stopped like that. Off the motorway. And then the two cars that were buying were just pulled up. Paddy went on the run to France and then on to Spain before being arrested and brought back to England under heavy security. Put us on a plane to Newcastle. When it gets on the plane to Newcastle, we looks out the window, the tarmac is surrounded with machine gunned cops. Um, everybody's thinking, what the fuck's that for? It was for me. I'd never seen machine guns in my life, but they had the plane surrounded on the tarmac. It was as if I was a terrorist. They were floating to Newcastle. We landed at Newcastle Airport. I was in the back of a van. Left the guys off the plane and went to drive us back to Newcastle. And I looked out the back of the van when we were driving back down to the town and they had the army escorting us, Land Rovers escorting us from the Newcastle Airport to the police station. And I, I looked, and I'd only shipped me, so I'd seen the army fucking escorting us. And uh, Dudley, the copper who had arrested us, was sat and facing us. And I just looked at him, aren't you fucking kidding, aren't you? I said, a fucking taxi would have done. And he just saw the place he'd done. Conroy was sentenced to 11 and a half years and locked up again as a high-risk Cat A prisoner. But even inside, the wars continued. In 1996, in Whitemore Prison, Conroy and Sayers clashed violently. 
cool. And when it gets into the holding room, he was in the toilet. So I just had to walk into the toilet, just just to pull him. And uh, he was waiting for us. <laughs> he fucking landed one right on me fucking chin. Whack! Knocked us off me fucking feet just about. Didn't expect it, like. And I hit the fucking wall. I remember hitting the wall after he's hit us. And I thought I was flying at first. I didn't know where I was. <laughs> But I got my feet in and I realised I've hit the wall and my feet on the ground, but it was flo slippy, the toilet floor. So I slipped on my arse in, I landed on my arse in and he was on top of us. But I just fucking grabbed him, I was up in half a second. I just punched his fucking head in, to be honest. And there was more to come. After their release, John Sayers had his revenge on Conroy on the streets of Newcastle. This is the scene of the infamous Sayers Conroy uh, battle and uh, over the road there, up just outside the post office, Paddy's car was blocked in by um, members of the Sayers gang. He got out of his car to confront them. Um, there was a, I can only describe it as a brawl between Paddy and a number of men. And when he was laying on the floor after being kicked, um, he was slashed with a craft knife across his face. And the police arrived and Paddy was arrested. I jumped out the fucking car and I went straight for him. Come here, you. And he just fucking shit himself and got out that car and he fucking run. And he wouldn't come back. I went, come here. And he wouldn't come fucking back until all his mates had gotten into that cars and got And once I was surrounded with his mates, that's when he come fucking back. But anyway, I, I was poorly that day anyway. So, so he come back. So we just saw them in the middle of the main road, Westgate Hill, outside the post office. So we're gonna obviously it's fight starting. Um, and he managed to get in and punch us a couple of times in a newt. I was trying to watch all these fucking lads behind us as well as about fucking twelve of them. And he punched us twice in the lips and newt and on the chin, but he hadn't hurt us at all. And I had to give me heat a fucking shake to be honest and say what the fuck's going on, yeah, to myself. And I went, oh, you're fucking stoned, you useless cunt. I just realised in my cell I just had a joint for the fight. Um, so I just took my time and I thought, right, just get him in and just fucking take him down. And I did, I just thought it went something mad like that. I just went, eh. And they must have thought he's went crazy, him. And he, as, as I'd done that, he jumped in. I just thought, come here, cunt. And I just took him down on the floor and wrapped him up. I was just about to give him it, really, and that's when they all jumped on us. But it's John says he couldn't fight to save his life. He's a, he's a big girl's blows. He's one of them who just guns into the ball as soon as, you, as soon as he's in trouble. He's not a man at all. Despite the bad blood between them and CCTV footage clearly showing the attack on Conroy, Paddy refused to help the police or give any evidence against the Sayers. That was well, I got kicked in the head and fucking, I got slashed off one of them. Michael Sears, he come through with a cut throat. It was like a jail one, you know, the craft knives. And I remember, as I was getting kicked, he just come on top of us. Um, I was on my back on the ground and he sort of stuck it in there, this craft knife, and I just grabbed him as it went in, just there. I didn't have the strength really to pull him away, so I just twisted my hand like that. And as I twisted it, that's when he pulled it. That's how I only ended up getting a, like a fin cut across the top of my face. Because I'd sort of pulled it out, pulled it like that, and it's just as he was cutting us. Um, and I was a bit concussious then. I was just, I think I was a bit concussious. I, I remember getting up and down into a shop and blood was pouring all over the shop counter. And then uh, my pal got us to the hospital. Another man who became involved in a dispute with the Conroy firm was Brian Cockrell, who allegedly stole from one of their associates. Cockrell and his partner, Lee Duffy, made their living robbing drug dealers. They called it taxing. Um, we got into it because the drug dealers was, in them days, in the early, late 80s, early 90s, people used to sell the cannabis. And the cannabis was like 3,600 pound a key in them days and there'd be maybe 10 big dealers in every town. So they'd get the gear in, we'd find out where they were, kick the doors in, take it off them, and make a fortune off it in them days. Nobody run to the police like they do now. 
and uh, that's how we made our money. But uh, Lee got stabbed to death through it. And then I got another tax partner. It was uh, Mark Holmes, a better known as Speedy. He was shot to death, shot to death through it. And then, uh, there's been about another 20 people over the last 28 years I've been doing it. And they've been shot to death or stabbed to death. So I've been quite lucky to be still here today. These are the type of streets where me and Lee would tax places like this, you know, council estates, no disrespect with people who live in council estates, but they'd, they'd, they'd have a little house like this, and we'd go say, this for this house, just for sick, talking sick there. I'd have one at the back door and one at the front, and you'd go to the door, and they wouldn't answer the door, and you'd have to kick the door in, but sometimes they'd run out the back, so you'd have somebody who could run with you, and you'd have somebody who could drive. And we used to take the cars off them, not just the money, and we'd take the jewellery, because when people buy drugs, they might pawn the chains and so that we'd get a load of gold we'd take cars off them and the car would just break down we'd just fucking leave it in the street and go and get another car for someone else and i remember lee, lee getting in a convertible one day and he, lit, he opened the roof up and the roof just fucking blew off and we'd go about 70 mile an hour on the road and oh fuck it we'll get another one he said plenty of people threatened to kill cockle but they did so at their own risk yeah there was a lad who was uh, from red car he was telling everyone he was going to have me killed, the one with the bowling ball, and he put spikes in it and everything and drill bits. And Anyway, we got him, he put it above the door in his house, and he thought, when well, my cockle comes in here, I'll pull this rope and I'll let him on. He didn't kill him. So we seen him, and it was, it was pouring down. It was, uh, I think it was about a Wednesday. And uh, we seen him in the street, we grabbed him, put him in a car, allegedly. Took him, put him in a boat, put a bag on his head, and uh, tie wraps on his feet and his legs. And uh, I took him down the gear, which is near Red Car, and allegedly kicked him in the sea. Eventually, Cockle's taxing of drug dealers caught up with him when he was set up and ambushed. Walked in, about 12 lads, smashed me over the head with a hammer, stabbed me in the back, put a gun to my head. I dropped a few of them, um, throw them about the house. I was about 24 stone at the time, so they couldn't put me down. Fight went on for about 10 minutes. The boxing lad was in the kitchen. Jaw was broken, he shot him break his jaw. They hit me with hot bread bins. One hit me with a, it was like a sock made of leather, full of marbles, hit me in the face, and popped me eye. Didn't bust, but it felt like it bust. Uh, stabbed me, I got, uh, I had 176 stitches. Uh, I was still pints of blood. They battered me with baseball bat and hammers and stabbed me. And uh, I finally went down in the end. Um, they never broke a bone in my body. I was still trying to get back up and fighting them back, but uh, they left me for dead. They said that would be the end of him. So they took me to the hospital. The hospital said, if you weren't so big, the muscle tissue saved you from the skeleton tissue from being broke. Um, you'd probably be a dead man. Paddy Conroy was arrested for the attack on Cockrell, but never charged. Viv Graham was another hard man on the doors in Newcastle. Like Paddy Conroy and Brian Cockrell, he too was trying to stop hard drugs coming into the city's clubs, but it would prove to be his undoing. Well, he didn't like drugs. Didn't like drugs. He wouldn't have... Uh drugs sell in the pubs that I used to work at other clubs. But didn't you ever pull him and speak to Yeah, him? I used to speak to him. I used to say, you're getting too much involved and you want to calm down a bit, you know what I mean? What, what did he think? He went to everything, as he used to do, he just used to smile. You know what I mean? I'm OK, man, you know what I mean? He didn't, he weren't worried about it? No, no, he wasn't worried, worried about it, you know? But I used to tell him, I used to say, you want to watch what you're doing, you know? <laughs> On New Year's Eve 1993, Viv Graham was shot dead outside the Anchor Pub in the city centre. He was 34 years old. Uh, two men waited for him to come out of a pub and um, they shouted out, Happy New Year, Viv, and as he turned around, they shot him three times with a magnum. Uh, one of the wounds was described by a doctor as, um, you know, it could have been done by a, a cannon shell. It made a hole the size of a watermelon. 
um, in his groin. And unsurprisingly, Viv uh, bled to death. He died that night in the hospital. And his murder remains unsolved. It's one of the, the big mysteries on Tyneside. He was naive, you know, you know with Viv, Viv was the most naive geezer I have ever met in my life. I don't know how he lasted so long. I really don't know somebody didn't shoot him before that. Because he was a bully. There are various theories in Newcastle as to why he was murdered. Although some people believe that he was involved in selling drugs, the majority firmly believe he was trying to stop them. Are you saying that Viv Graham is involved in drugs? Oh, aye. Oh, no danger. No danger. But he never sold him. He just knew who it was. I mean, not amongst good people, but well, people who would stick up his buddy. That's all he ever done. You know, he should not take a lot as well. But he had a kind of few quid, but he gambled. He said, like, 500 quid, grand on horses, like, regular. And uh, he didn't drink that much. But he certainly was at the drugs. He just, he just took his work, didn't he? Off the right people. So he was taxing drug dealers? Oh, aye. Well, aye, of course he was. And do, do, you think, do you think they'll ever solve that murder? No, I know. No chance. No chance. In a terrible irony, Viv Graham's eldest son, Dean, died of a drugs overdose. His youngest son, Viv Jr., agreed to meet me and take me to their graves. So, uh, how do you feel coming back here, Viv? To where your father's buried and your brother? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it just brings back memories, really. Um, it's not somewhere where I come often, you know. Um, maybe it's once a year. Why, why, why don't you feel like coming back? Is it just know. too too many memories? And uh, if I had them both here, yeah, my dad and my brother, you know, it would time would have been different. And have you heard over the years what? What, why you may have been murdered? I have heard different stories, you know, um, because he was stopping drugs, because he was supposedly selling drugs. Uh, and what, why do you think it was? Stopping would, drugs or I would, selling? I would like to believe that it was stopping them, you know, because uh, they've, ruined, they've ruined our family. Drugs, losing my brother. Um, I, I would definitely. I want to believe that that it is that. Newcastle still bears the scars from over 50 years of gang warfare, but the Geordie old school criminal elite are now in their twilight years. They've been replaced by younger, more ruthless villains whose only governor is the gun. Armed robberies committed in the 80s funded the avalanche of drugs that later hit Britain and changed society forever. Yeah.